Um, apologies for having my remarks on my telephone. Um, so I, I am so excited. I love, I love Elizabeth, and I love this new book. Wait, can we turn off the tunes? Thank you, thank you. Um, so this new book is perfect. It's perfect, and I'll tell you a little bit why. But first I'm going to say... I told you it was a mistake for them to let me do this. <laughs> so my favorite thing about Elizabeth McCracken, and we can all compare these lists, um, is that she could write a novel or a memoir or a collection of stories about literally anything in any direction, and I wouldn't be shocked, just delighted. I would have believed it if she'd made up the murderous molasses flood in <laughs> Bolaway. You didn't, apparently, but I, as far as I was concerned, you... you you had, um, because I trust Elizabeth's imagination and humor and perfect, complicated, glittering sentences to the ends of the earth. Um, if you're here or watching on YouTube, hello, YouTubers, um, you already know that Elizabeth McCracken is a national treasure and an actual genius, and we are very lucky to be her contemporaries and to read her books hot in our little hands um, when they come out. The hero of this book, Elizabeth's new novel, which is there behind me. Um, so to sort of misquote a Ted Berrigan poem that I love, it is slim, dazzling, feminine, marvelous, and tough. I won't bore you with a million facts about all of Elizabeth's books, except to say that I read The Giant's House when it was published in 1996, and I have been her devoted fan ever since. Just read them all, read them all. Why would you not read them all? Um, I'm so delighted to welcome Elizabeth McCracken here to Books Are Magic, and as always, always, it is a pleasure to have one of our in-house ringers, <laughs> my friend Ruman Alam, novelist extraordinaire, and I say extraordinaire just because he just got back from Paris, and so he is, in fact, a few shades fancier than usual. Um, please help me welcome Ruman and Elizabeth. Power move, things. power move. I, I love know. that. I'm going to take that. that. I'm also going to put lipstick on because I forgot to look. <laughs> we just had a drink and a few snacks. A drink? <laughs> if you say so. It was a single enormous drink. But I forgot to um, refresh my lipstick. <clears throat> so it's going to take me just a second. This is fun. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are you going to read before we before I ask you questions? Yeah, then? why not? Okay. <laughs> well, Elizabeth's going to read. So I, I'll just sit here looking charming. What, what color lipstick. is the lipstick? So what's the name this of is um, it's L'Oreal, and it's Devil's Mat. Well, there, you yeah. there you go. <laughs> Can I borrow your book for a second? <laughs> I'm gonna don't, be... don't crib my notes, though. <laughs> or disagree with I'm gonna, them. I'm going to surprise you. The element of surprise matters here. There's a very... I'm just going to be like a page and a half um, from the beginning. I already got lipstick. <laughs> Look at your notes. I was going to sell that on eBay, so... I'm just going to be a tiny bit from the... From, this is... There aren't exactly chapters, but this is sort of from the second, second section. Everything makes more sense if you know what my parents looked like. My father was six foot three, and for the last 40 years of his life, enormous in every direction, 300 pounds or more. Photos reveal that he was relatively thin for parts of my early childhood. That father, the one with the mustache, and plenty of sandy blonde hair, has been replaced in my head by the white-bearded fat father, the one children on the street mistook for Santa Claus, which he enjoyed as long as the nearby parent didn't say, you better be good or he won't bring you any presents. <laughs> he was mostly shy. Some people were frightened by his size and silence. In my childhood, I sometimes was. He had a stutter and a temper and an encyclopedic memory a capacious metaphorical heart, an enlarged anatomical one. I'm really getting lipstick all over your body. <laughs> he didn't take care of himself. His eyes were large and very blue. 
You couldn't tell exactly how many teeth he'd lost to neglect. I don't remember him ever going to a dentist because his beard hid it. My mother was less than five feet tall. Walked with canes during my childhood, had tarnished black hair. She wore in a bun, was talkative had black eyebrows even when her hair had gone mostly white, was olive-skinned. She said that wherever she went, she met lonely men who mistook her for a countrywoman, spoke Turkish and Spanish and Urdu at her. Once in print in The New Yorker, a famous friend of my father's described a dinner with my parents, a Rabelaisian prodigy and his wife, a beautiful Oriental. <laughs> she was a Jewish girl of Eastern European descent, born in a small town near Des Moines, Iowa, the older of twin girls. She always loved what made her statistically unusual. Any writer will be asked, oh, sorry, I skipped over the most important part, sorry. <laughs> I have no interest in ordinary people, having met so few of them in my life. <laughs> Any writer will be asked, why? Why write? Why write this book? What made you do it? If I showed you a photograph of my parents, I think you'd understand. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. It's such a pleasure to be at Books for Magic. Um, I wrote down my questions in the back, and this is a real challenge for my vanity because I can't read with my glasses on anymore. <laughs> um, sorry. I'm gonna quote something you said on Twitter, which is probably bad form, but I've seen you describe this book as a book that you never meant to write. And I'm very curious about what that means. Um, first of all, your mom. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. We've already had this conversation, yeah. but it's a great, a great thrill yeah. and a great honor. So. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> and I'm really sorry about the lipstick on your book. Um, I mean, I guess in some ways, I think. I didn't mean to write it because I began to write it because I was thinking about my actual mother mm -hmm. um, and ways to keep her close after she died. Uh, and there are those books that I have written because I sort of think, oh, it's time for me to write a novel. What am I interested in? What am I going to write about? And there, then there are the things that I have written thinking, I think I have to, to write s something about this thing that has happened to me in my life. Um, and that I don't necessarily, when I start doing that sort of writing, I don't necessarily think of it as something that's going to be a book. Um, yeah, sometimes I start books and sometimes I just write. Mm. And this is one of the second things. Okay. So to be clear, this is a novel that I'm yes. holding in my hands. Um, but you, what you just said is that you felt some impulse to write after the death of your mother. So was that impulse toward fiction or was it toward nonfiction or is that a bad question to ask? It's a terrible question. <laughs> I can't believe I'll you leave. asked it. I'll leave. <laughs> um, it's a really interesting question because I wrote it as a novel and I didn't, it's not something that I wrote thinking, oh well, figure out what this is when I'm done with it. Um, I started it as a novel. And I don't think I would have written it without that decision. Um, partially because I think better in fiction than I do in nonfiction. I think in nonfiction okay. I'm skittish. Uh, I'm going to stop you. <laughs> <laughs> what is the difference between the act of writing fiction and the act of writing nonfiction. Why, what, what effect does it have on the clarity of your thinking? It's a really good question. I'm not sure I have an answer except for the fact that it seems important to me to be able to stride it off into whatever I'm writing, knowing what it is that I'm writing. 
that if I thought, mm, maybe it's novel, maybe it's nonfiction, I'll see that every time I took a stride in the work, I would be uncertain. And so I made the decision quite early on. And in the very earliest versions of this book, it was much more novel-like mm -hmm. uh, with people who did not resemble people in my life at all. Um, and then I started writing more. I mean, I don't want to be disingenuous because the main character of the book is very similar. One might say identical. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to say that. No, but, but, One might say. But not identical in the way that no representation of any human being in a book is a one-to-one -one correspondence with um, an actual human being who are all more complicated than any character who could ever be in a novel or in a memoir. And... I, one of the reasons I decided to, to, to write a novel is that I didn't want to be sort of constrained by, by the truth. I'm pausing because I, I don't want to be disingenuous other than to, to say that besides the fact that my own very beloved mother hated memoirs about parents. <laughs> um, but I also thought pretty clear, I felt pretty firmly would actually love to be the topic of a book. Um, I think she would have actually really loved it. And I needed to figure out a way to, to write about her in which I wasn't worried with every sentence that I wrote. Okay, so this is not a question I have written down, but, and it may be an unfair question to ask, but do you think that Natalie McCracken thought that she existed inside of the fiction of Elizabeth McCracken. No. No, I don't think she did. Um, and there's a there's a, a passage uh, in the book in which I talk about being um, a writer in college, and I was giving one of the first readings I ever gave, and I was reading a short story that was not about my mother at all, but was a first person story which I said my mother my mother this my mother that and the first time I said the words my mother like two people turned around and looked at my mother who was <laughs> at the back of the room and then the next time five <laughs> and by the end of the story everybody was looking at my mother every time I said the words my mother um, and she really liked that um, <laughs> even though she was very clearly not the mother in this story at all um, but I think, I mean, she was, she was quite a remarkable human being in many ways, and she really loved, more than most people I know, she loved being the center of attention. And I mean that in a healthy way. She did, she wouldn't, like, she did not do any, like, do anything awful to become the center of attention. She was kind and eccentric, and just liked people knowing about her, but, like, in a very healthy way that I think maybe more people should be comfortable with the idea of <laughs> going, yeah, if you, lead your, if you lead a good life, people will pay attention to you. So, a few years ago, you, you published a book, an exact replica of a figment of my imagination, which is a memoir. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit the impulse behind the writing of that memoir. And if you could explain to me the difference between that work, which is a memoir, and this work, which is a novel. Yeah, I mean, that's both a hard question, but also I feel like an easy one to answer. Um, I wrote an exact replica of a figment of my imagination, which was um, after my first child was still born and I sort of wanted a record of the experience. And I also sort of, it's this amazing thing that happens when you write about difficult things that they're actually, you can sit with them. Like it's, it feels sort of healthy. And I put all of the terrible feelings I had into a book. Um, 
And it was for that book, it was really important to me, even though I don't think that any memoir is accurate, that I work very hard to be as accurate as possible. So in that book, if there is dialogue in the book, if I felt like I remembered it exactly, it's in quotations. If I didn't, it's summarized. Even though I know that's false, that I there's no way that I remembered stuff directly. Um, but if I, I wanted, sort of in order to go on from that experience, I wanted to try to get accuracy on the page. And so, but the, the thing that's interesting is that when I wrote that book, I did not think that I was writing a book. I wrote down everything I remembered thinking that I was taking notes for something in the future. And I actually, one of the things that I remember is I sent it to my um, uh, beloved agent, Henry Dunow, who's here, and said, do you think this is a book? Um, and he said, yes. <laughs> and if he had said no, I wouldn't have published it. I would have put it, oh, that, I don't want to work on this anymore. I wrote it down for a specific reason. Um, and I don't think that I would have written a memoir except for the fact that I thought I'm going to write down as much as I remember and then I'll see what I want to do with it later. And in the case of this book, I knew I was writing a book. And I knew that the, the decision to write a novel made me feel freer um, and that also... There was a period of time where I was thinking, well, will I, before I started actually writing, will I write a memoir, will I write a novel? And it felt, I thought, well, if it's a novel, it has to do these things. And if it's a memoir, it has to do these things. And when I realized that wasn't true, <laughs> that there were not actually rules for either category of book, um, I felt so much freer and also like I would be most free in, in writing a novel. Okay, it's news to me that there are no rules for those <laughs> forms. There are no rules. Um, That's great. Anything it's, is allowed. It's also extremely irritating to me that <laughs> the memoir was just notes to yourself. Because if that is your notes to yourself, then I'm just going to jump off the book. Because, uh, an exact replica of the figure of my imagination is a masterpiece. I'm sure a lot of people in this room have read it. Um, I mean, that there's no, I have no point. That's not even a question. In my book, I'm just saying that it's a masterpiece. It is an extraordinary book about a bad thing happening in one's life and simply looking directly at that thing. And if that is how you look at things, that's fucked up. You should be <laughs> um, That's the only point I have to make. So you feel freer in the... So just, I'm going to recap, like this is how good teachers teach, I'm going to recap what we've discussed. Uh, Elizabeth feels freer in the fictional form than in the memoir form, even though as discussed the memoir form comes annoyingly easily to her. Um, okay, I'm going to read something because she, Elizabeth only read very briefly and I'm going to read something from page 87, hang on. Um, there's lipstick all over my book, I can't read it. <laughs> This is Elizabeth's words, not mine. I've heard some memoirs say that they don't worry whether their renditions of people are fair. Since there is no fair, we all have our own memories and a memoir is one person's. What's the difference between a novel and a memoir? Well, that's the million dollar question. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Permission to lie. Permission to cast aside worries about plausibility. Is your work autobiographical? People like to ask. And when I was young, I would say, no, not factually, but it's emotionally autobiographical. I believed it. <laughs> I hid things in my early stories. And the circuit performers and the elderly criminals, the drunks, the tattooed women, the woman, the mysterious huckster who insisted she was family. I gave characters my secrets, but not my face or biography. I saddled them with things I believed about myself but had never told anyone. A painter putting my face in a convex mirror at the back of the room, and an engraver hiding my initials in the mane of a historical horse. <laughs> Why are you such a good writer? It's kind of annoying. Um, okay. So, 
you're just a liar. Okay, tell me the truth. <laughs> like, what is the difference between a novel and a memoir? Do you have an answer for this question, or do you really not have an answer? I do not. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't. And I, like, my dumb answer about this book is it was a novel when I wrote it. Maybe it's not a novel now, or maybe when people read it, it's not a novel. Although there are a lot of, there, there are fictional people in it. Um, although nothing that is about the mother in the book is fictional. Um, but I, I, you know, I went to graduate school in the late 80s uh, at the Iowa Writers Workshop, 88 to 90. And at that time, they were really hard lines between every kind of writing. Like there was not, literary science fiction mm -hmm. did not exist. <laughs> literary mystery, that everything that, you know, that you could absolutely not write creative, like people would talk about creative nonfiction as though, yeah, that's not really a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Quite late, like again, you know, decades after people were writing creative nonfiction, <laughs> people were, eh, it's not really a thing. And the older I get as both a writer and as a teacher of writing, the more I think that those divisions are not that interesting. And whether it is, you know, there are brilliant books that are so literary and are also hard science fiction. Yeah. Um, and that was like an, un, an inconceivable thing when I went to graduate school, the idea, because it was just, it was different. Um, in the minds of people. And so I do sort of want to push towards the idea that, um, yeah, I don't think there are rules, except I think every writer, and I'm, I know that you have, you, you have those rules you set up for yourself in terms of like, what's the difference, whether you're writing or whether you're reading other people's work, you think, oh, I think this is this and that is that. And I think that's fine. I, think, I mean, they're, Tons of things that I read, and I think, oh yeah, that's not. I don't think that's literary. Um, but I, I, I think that getting rid of those lines is better for writers, but also better for writing. Mm -hmm. That I, that idea that there's so many things that that I was taught. Oh, you don't do this, mm -hmm. and it's made up. Mm -hmm. It's a rule that somebody made for themselves because they didn't. They were feeling snobby mm -hmm. or inadequate. Um, and I do think, again, both as a writer and as a teacher of writing, that the, the, the fewer constraints there are in the things that we write, the better off we are. Mm -hmm. That said, Paris Review recently got rid of, or at least they did yes. last issue. I don't like that. They, <laughs> they're publishing prose with no <laughs> distinction between whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And I can't defend why I'm like, no. <laughs> Wrong and bad, I don't like it. I want to read, I want to, and I guess it may only just be because I want to read something on the terms that the writer who wrote it has established for their work. Right, you want to know. Yeah. If you're reading a cookbook, is it a novel or is it a cookbook? <laughs> if you don't know, then you yeah. feel a little adrift as a reader. Yeah, they're you're like, Sriracha's on a yeah. crazy <laughs> ride in this, <laughs> this short story. Um, I forgot to ask if I'm supposed to leave time for audience questions. So, uh, Emma, you can just yell at me when it's time for me to shut up. Um, okay, so we've established that we can't actually, like, clarify the genre into which the book in my hands easily slots. But I'm going to read something else that is not, I'm, I'm not going to ask any more questions about whether this is a novel or not a novel because it's not interesting. Um, but I'm going to read, oh, fuck, where is it that I wanted to read? I'm sorry. Um, oh, okay. Here it is. <clears throat> Some members of a family might never really trust the writer in their midst. <laughs> it's an uncomfortable laugh from Emma Stroud. <laughs> With good reason, you tell me. By which I mean the fictional me is unmarried and only child, childless. The actual me is not. 
The fictional me is the narrator of this book. The actual me is, an, is the author. All Cretans are liars. I myself am a Cretan. <laughs> now, I'm telling the truth now, I swear. I have a brother and some offspring, and I'm married. I love everyone, and I want to keep them safe. Safe from me, particularly. Long ago, by which I mean before I had children, I had firm feelings about the relationship between children and their parents' literary works. I would read memoirs and primly think, but what will your children think when they read that? <laughs> <laughs> Back then, I thought the duty of a parent was to, re was to remain a mysterious monolith of love and care. I no longer do. It's impossible one way or the other, but I have left my living family out. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you about what form this book occupies, but I'm going to ask you about your actual family and the <laughs> tension between... I just, I told you, I just listened to your memoir again, and you are talking about the loss of a child. You have two children who are alive now. Um, what is their relationship to that material? What is your brother's relationship to your novel about the mother that you shared? What is your husband, who is also a novelist, what is his relationship to the fictional self and the actual self? Or do you not think about that? Does that not matter? I don't know. I have, I have two members of my actual family in the audience. <laughs> um, Maybe they should come up here. <laughs> Frank and Kathy can come up. Um, I, and I did, I told my brother way ahead of time that I was writing the book um, and, and sent it to him and we haven't, he's, he's very private um, and we have a, a, a lovely relationship. Um, and he hasn't mentioned it, which I think is maybe his stance towards the book. Um, and I do, I did, I did leave. There's nobody alive who's in the book, other than a, a character who's something like me. And I actually do think, which is maybe very maddening. There's a difference between the narrator and the mother, because the mother is as close to a version of my mother as I could get on the page. But the narrator, there's not that actually that much information about mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be for either artistic or chicken shit reasons, <laughs> <laughs> which is always the thing that one has to worry about. Um, there's not very much about the narrator. There's, there's no biographical stuff, or very little biographical stuff about the, about the narrator in the book. I can't remember your question, but I'm trying to answer Okay, it. so I guess the question really is like, what is for you the moral question in this tension between your actual children, your actual spouse, your actual brother, your actual parent, and the work that you do on the page? Well, I mean, w one of the things that I will say is that when I wrote my memoir, I was actually worried about how my mother who was a, a strange combination of being a total extrovert and loving people and also being very personally private. Mm -hmm. And I was worried how she would feel about a memoir that I wrote that was very personal. And she was so lovely about it. Um, you know, I published the book and I sent her the book. I, I can't imagine writing a book and send it to somebody for to say, is this okay? Mm -hmm. Like, all I can do is write the book that I want to write um, and worry about stuff later on. And my experience is actually, and this, actually, this may be my biggest piece of advice that I have for writers, is that those fears that you have about publishing books are overblown. That th when things feel hugely personal and emotional, and you think, oh my God, I'm in that passage that, that you read, oh my gosh, I'm being so brave, I'm exposing my, myself so much. People are either like, yeah, nice book. <laughs> <laughs> or it means something to them. Um, and my, and my, mother, my mother wrote me the, the, the loveliest note after she read my memoir. 
about which, and, and I and I honestly hadn't known that she would feel that way, that she that she that she approved of me having written that book, which is something that I thought about when I wrote this book. Even though I think that like if if I had sent this book to my mother and said, "What do you think?" she'd go, "Well, you got that wrong," <laughs> and um, I wish you hadn't written about this. But you're right, I am. I'm very funny. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I thought about that as, as I wrote the book. And I don't, I don't know, I, I feel like th that question of like what, what's moral when you write about other people looms larger in the mind of the writer than it does. That if you're worried about what's moral and whether you should write about it, you're already doing a better job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm than mm -hmm. the people who don't worry about that at right. all and who will actually <laughs> hurt other people and don't care. That, 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 that thinking about it will work its way into the work. So the approval, the, the art is not contingent on the approval. No. You were doing this thing regardless. Yes. Yeah, you're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, I'm, gonna I'm gonna switch. Okay, so I'm gonna read some more from the book. My understanding of my own soul is pre-literate. Wife, daughter, mother, friend, some people write in their social media biographies. Why on earth? <laughs> Applying any words to who I am feels like a straight pin aimed at my insect self. I won't have it, I can't do it. Okay, so I want you to, I want to linger on that for a minute, because what you're saying, I think, okay, what the narrator of this book is saying. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I hope I don't have any fact checkers in the audience, is that there's a distance, there's a, you won't affix, the narrator of this book will not affix themselves in those terms. You just said to me earlier that like there's not a lot about the narrator of this book, but is there not? And I, I, I want to hear you talk about that. I want to hear you talk about the extent to which you've written um, one actual work of memoir and one novel that seems designed to confound those who want to insist it is a memoir, um, but doesn't reveal the actual self and. I don't know. I I just want to hear you explain yourself because I feel like you have to be sort of an ego monster to write anything at all. Um, but you're telling me that you are insistent on not being that self on the page. Oh, I think you can be an ego monster and not put yourself in your own books. And I do think that the the I was really aware when I was writing that passage that it's it's quite. Maybe disingenuous is the wrong word. So I think it's quite sincere saying, I don't want these um, really ordinary autobiographical terms to be applied, the narrator is saying. I don't want to, in, the, in this world where we give casual autobiography all the time, mm -hmm. including in Twitter biographies, you know, father, <laughs> husband, <laughs> beer enthusiast. <laughs> Um, and that people are used to doing this sort of like, how do I sum myself up in my Twitter biography or, you know, on Instagram? Um, and I'm also aware of those terms are really important to people. Um, and this I do feel like for the narrator, those terms are not, even though it's a ridiculous thing to say, as the first person narrator of a book, <laughs> mm -hmm. to say, I oh, know I'm going to put all of those things, mm -hmm. those things away, um, and it's sort of. I mean, there are a lot of things in the book that are, that are playing with that sort of notion of. I refuse to say anything about myself, including the the inscription for the book, is like literary, liter literally as well as literally, but literally a photograph mm -hmm. of, of an, inscription. an inscription that I wrote, literally wrote to my mother on my first book 
which I think is the first book I ever inscribed to anybody. It's on Mother's Day in 1993, in which I promised my mother, and this is, this is literally <laughs> me promising my literal mother that I'll never make her a character in my fiction. <laughs> <laughs> And then the... How do you sleep at night? <laughs> yeah, disturb my dog. Um, which I got from my mother, my ability to sleep. She was good at sleeping, I'm good at sleeping. And then there's the, the epigraph is a... Um, from my, one of my favorite Elizabeth Bishop um, poems, which says, but you're one of them, you are an Elizabeth even though in the book the narrator talks about being an unnamed narrator. Um, I don't know where I'm going, except for the fact that I think I'm very clever sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it pleased me so much <laughs> to realize that I wanted that Elizabeth Bishop poem to be yeah. the epigraph to the book, even though the narrator literally talks about not, not having a name, but also talks about how she has a name that her mother gave to her. Although, the, I'll, I'll let readers discover the quibble between daughter and mother about the genesis of that particular yeah. name. Um, you just mentioned, I'm in the section that I read, and also you just mentioned in your remarks, um, social media. And I wonder if you could, so Elizabeth, I think everyone in this audience probably knows this, is really one of the best users of Twitter alive, right? Like, I, I think she's really mastered the form. But I wonder, I'm, I'm curious to hear, I've never asked you this, and I've, I've wondered, um, the relationship between the actual person and the person who we meet on screen. Like, what is the distance between the, the self and the avatar of the self? And is it in some way analogous to what we encounter in this novel? It probably is, because I do feel like it's not quite the same person. One of the most, one of the most influential writers for me is actually Calvin Trillin. Um, I, I have to go home now, I'm sorry. But <laughs> like, actually, I need to lie down. Please say Because me. you're disturbed No, I'm just, excited. I'm shocked, I'm just shocked. I'm, um, and he was. If you had, who, if you had said to me, "I'll give you ten million dollars <laughs> to name the person Elizabeth McCracken is about to say," it, I would never have come up with Calvin. <laughs> God love him, but go on, please. And and, and partly because he was somebody who everybody in my household read, mm -hmm. but also he has this persona when he writes that is clearly not actually a human being, but is charming and funny and. Um, there he you know he talks about legends in his family and 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 tons of running jokes. I mean, actually, in a really weird, I'm gonna I've never talked about this before, but I'm gonna make a make a play for saying that Calvin Trillin, in a, in a weird way, is like a proto Twitterer in that way. Oh my God! Please somebody tweet this right now. <laughs> <laughs> he talks about Fats Goldberg, the one who yeah. makes pizza, and as you know, I used to. I still do sometimes refer to my mother as the self-proclaimed inventor of the mojito. And I, that's, that's a direct reference to the sorts of jokes that Calvin fell in there. Um, and that we, you know, that, um, and I'm, I'm speaking particularly of his, the, the books that he, he wrote about his, the food his, books about, yeah. about his wife, Alice. Yeah. Um, and of all of the things that have happened in my writing career, Many, many years ago, I was a finalist for the National Book Award, and two amazing things happened to me. One, as I was walking to the dinner, I got knocked over by a photographer who was photographing Toni Morrison and Lucille Clifton walking down a carpet. And I was like, hey, and then I turned around and I saw Toni Morrison and Lucille Clifton, and I was like, you were right. <laughs> they were, and they were having a conversation with each other, and it was, it, it felt like just amazing to see. And then afterwards, I talked to Alice Trillin at the the dinner, and it was, you know, it was like meeting 
this somebody, this yeah. significant person yeah. who I had read about. Um, and so I, th I mean, I think, I do think there's a, th th that's the question about the avatar that you're asking, mm -hmm. that I don't think no person on Twitter, or as we all know, or Instagram or Facebook, is actually the person who's writing those things. There's always a distance. There's always sort of a stance and a number of, of running jokes, but I love those running jokes. Mm -hmm. And I, I tweeted a, a lot about my mother when she was alive, and I always asked her, which is another reason why I felt more confident about writing the book, I always asked my mother how she, before I tweeted anything, I always asked her permission. And, and, and what did she say? Did she enjoy it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> she loved it. Yeah. I mean, a couple of times she'd like, oh, okay, you can tweet it. And then she would say, what did people say? <laughs> and I would say... True Twitter user. People think did people really like funny. it? Yeah. Um, people, yeah, the, and, and she would, yeah, like, I would, I would never tweet anything that somebody said to me mm -hmm. without asking permission. Mm -hmm. I don't, sometimes I tweet about my kids, I always ask them mm -hmm. um, beforehand, and I always ask my mother, and, and I largely tweeted about her when we were together. And she did really like it because, she, you know, my mother was hellaciously funny. <laughs> so, so just to push on this, do you think your experience of using Twitter as Elizabeth McCracken, but also as Elizabeth McCracken, was useful in constructing this book? So, somebody asked me um, not that question, but a similar question, and I hadn't thought. I would not have written this book without the experience of being a mother. Because I'd had the experience of doing that thing in which I was writing a first person narrative um, that felt um, not revealing. I also, like often on Twitter, I will write the most embarrassing thing that happened to me that day, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which I wouldn't normally like write about in fiction. but. Like, I'm really drawn to when something <laughs> terrible or embarrassing happens to me, like, to, to turn it. I don't know if you know this, but um, I was attacked by geese in April <laughs> <laughs> while I was swimming. And I will say, I did not think as I was being, I swim every morning in this um, swimming pool in the center of Austin. And I did not think while I was being attacked by geese, this is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> but by the time I got home, I thought, I'm going to tweet, oh my god, I was attacked by <laughs> um, And it did turn this ridiculous thing that happened to me into, and I, I think this is how I think about memoir in general, um, it turned it into a story and it put it outside of my body in a way that was really useful. And that's the big thing that I feel about my actual memoir is that I wrote about something that I didn't think that I could talk about, and then you put it into a book, and you're like, oh, I talk about books. That's one of the things that I do in the world. Mm -hmm. And that actually, I can talk about that. Um, and I think when I, was, when I was working on this book, it's sort of the same thing, which is that um, anything I put into a book, I can talk about. But I th also think that, that Twitter was useful because I already had this sort of voice that I was working mm -hmm. on that's sort of self-deprecating and mm -hmm. occasionally farcical and um, and it was it was available to me in a way that I think that if I weren't on Twitter that I wouldn't have even when I was though when I was writing the book I wasn't thinking of that in retrospect I think absolutely if I were not on Twitter I wouldn't have written this book well the Agents and editors who are shaming us for wasting our time there <laughs> will take note of this particular message. I, I, I want to make clear to, um, I don't think that writers have to be on Twitter. But I think that if you enjoy Twitter, mm -hmm. there's no shame in that. Okay, this much shame. But, <laughs> but I think, I, I, what I've always felt about Twitter is that it's a leisure activity. It's sort of right. like people used to golf. <laughs> I know people still golf. People still golf. Yeah. We don't. Um, yeah. The people who run the world still golf. Um, but like, there are things you can accomplish, 
like networking and golfing. Yeah. yeah. But if you don't like golfing, you should not learn golf in order right. to network. Right. That's a good. That's a good way of putting it. Right? Except for it's miniature golf. <laughs> <laughs> um. At the same time, as I as we have talked about this book as like a book about you know, the relationship between a narrator and, and her mother and the tension between you and your your own mother. This is also just a book about a person walking around a European city and thinking, uh, which is to me like very high literary. It's like the highest <laughs> literary form possible, right? Forward. Like that is like, I mean, I said this to you just before when we were having drinks, but that's like every Patrick Modiano novel is about that, just walking around and thinking about your mom. Um, I wonder if this book, or what this book does to your sense of yourself as a writer. Did you think, yeah, that's a tough question, right? Yeah. Did you think that this was the kind of book you would write, or did you think that you were a different kind of writer, or have you not thought about it yet? I think it's a one-off. I mean, I do think that, you know, my other novels are, take place over years and years, and are about, you know, sort of characters and their interactions, and the, the, the most significantly, the, the plots are over years and years. And the present plot of this book is a walk around London. Um, and I don't think that I'll write another book like that. Um, but this book is really good. Maybe you should. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the long, I, you know, I love the long, sprawling family history. Plus, Bullaway is like a century, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, but I also don't, I mean, don't, don't you think this about writing... Oh, I don't, One book any, I, don't about <laughs> I don't have any opinions about writing. <laughs> but it's one of the pleasures of writing books is that, and the, this is disgustingly a quote from this book, <laughs> <which is laughs> that you think you're one sort of writer. Mm. And you believe that so that you can write a book. But that it does actually shift. And that every time... I have written a book, and I think that when most people write books, you write them going, oh, I'm this kind of writer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the things that is both wonderful and necessary about being a writer over years and years, and I was talking to Henry about my, I published my first book, next year it will be 30 years. Um, and that um, I'm incredibly grateful, I'm grateful to, to Echo, who now publishes me, and has published my last three books. I'm grateful that I'm still publishing books, but also that I, I'm pausing and I'm to say, I'm grateful to myself. <laughs> <laughs> what a monster. I know, I'm a total, I'm awful. I do mean that I'm grateful to myself, but I do think that is important for, for writers. There are some super successful writers who can sort of think, oh, this is the sort of book that I write. And my, the people who buy my books are always going to be excited to get another one of this kind mm -hmm. of book. But I, it's a very rare thing that I think that actually happens, especially, um, I mean, I think if you're consistently in the bestseller list, that, that's mm -hmm. one thing. But for most of us, it feels really essential to me to think that you can write a different kind of book. That there's not that w there's not one thing that you do, um, and that there's not one thing that people are waiting for, mm -hmm. and that every time you write a book, in a really good way, you're starting again. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think having written this book, which does feel like a one-off, I'm I'm not going to start writing autobiographical books. Um, that are based on my own experience and that are so that that you know have this um, frame of somebody walking around or um, a, a current time frame. But I also think, which again I feel like is the goal of being a writer, 
that I have changed the writer from having for having written that book. And the next book I write, even though it won't look like this book, will be informed by having written it. Yeah, and that I hope it's something that I like when to, I have a few student former students in, in in the audience here that you it's better not to think about the things that you're good at and to think about the things that you're interested in doing. Mm -hmm. Which is hard as a writer, because you always want to fall back on the things that you're good at. You always when people Say, oh, I really like that. You're like, well, I can do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like if you want to have a long writing life, you have to think about the things that you're interested in and not the things that you're good at or not the thing. The, the thing that I often say to my students is you have to be impatient with what you're good at. Um, but I think you always have to write books with this sense of, Oh, I wonder what I can do in this book. Or what I can do next. Yeah. yeah. Were you giving me the signal to ask questions? Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone in the audience have questions? I have more, but, <laughs> you know, this is your chance. So, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, hi. I was a student of yours many, many, many years ago. Um, and I want to... You said that um, it was, you could talk about difficult things in a book that are difficult to talk about. And I'm, I tend to, when something terrible happens to me, I also like to write it down. But I find it really difficult to stay with material that's really difficult. And I was wondering, how do you do it? That, like, how does it, I don't know, uh, you said if you, it gives you some distance, how, why is it difficult for me and it's not me? <laughs> I recognize nobody. Were you my student? Oh, me? Yeah. Yes, you, um, it, at Fine Arts Work Center, oh, yeah. uh, five day thing, and then you even wrote me a recommendation letter for Sarah yeah. Lawrence, and I got in. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah. Yeah. A long time ago. <laughs> and look, and look what's come. <laughs> Wait, sorry, what's your name? Nina Herzog. Oh, <laughs> so nice to see you. Thanks for coming. I think I may have even perhaps left you love notes. I'm very sorry. Perhaps <laughs> also some gifts. I was telling my friend, I think there was a lighter in there, which I don't understand. Anyway, nice any apologies you. that are necessary, please accept them. <laughs> Except the apologies, the lighter, the gift. Um, I. The, the one thing I have to say is that I do, I am good at believing that nobody's going to read what I'm writing when I'm writing it. Um, and that's, and even though sometimes I, I really do think sometimes when I'm writing, oh my God, this is so difficult. I'm just going to write it. Maybe nobody's going to see it. I can't believe I'm writing this. And then when I'm, I'm done with it, I'm like, <laughs> like that, that it doesn't, it no longer seems that difficult. It's sort of the the shadows that are cast by the things I'm about to write are much more frightening than actually having written them. Um, and so all I can do is just go ahead and, and write them. And um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. I, so you're I, not really feeling them necessarily as you're writing them. Like you're not really going, it's not like bringing it back. Like, oh God. No, I am. But then I feel much better when I'm on the other side. <laughs> uh -huh, that's the, that's the thing. Is that it seems terrifying and worrying before I write them. And, some, and very often when I'm writing them, and then I've written them and I'm like, oh, look at how tidy that is now in those paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And look at those really nice sentences. I'm very vain about my sentences. So that when I convert something to sentences, I'm, I'm happy, even if I don't know that I'm going to be happy when I think about writing those about those things. Anyone else? Uh, Ra something. Rachel has a question. Oh, Rachel! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if this is an ending question. Rachel, it's a little um, extra textual, but um, 
I feel like every time you write a book, I'm like, you're coming to Brooklyn? Well, you <laughs> haven't been for the last few. I'm very happy that you're here. And I guess I was just wondering, like, why this felt like the time, and if this is like a big post-pandemic, not post, but <laughs> moment for yeah. you, or Inter what it feels like intra, to be whatever. in New York and with all these publishing weirdos. I don't know. <laughs> Gosh, it's, this is the first bookstore event that I've done since 2019. Um, everything that I did, with, which is when I published Bowl Away, everything I did for the Souvenir Museum was, um, was oh virtual. Oh my god, you published a book. I forgot that you published another book. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks. I also did, which is I also forgotten, but yeah, god, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you forgot that you published that Well, book. I forgot, but... <laughs> I, can I just say, though, that I think that, and I, this is like a very, on the like sub list of things I want to talk to you about, is that the treatment in this book of the politics of the moment and the pandemic specifically is one of the most interesting aspects of it. It's like a very small thing, but it is, it, I think, a model for how, I think a lot, every writer who's negotiating with realism has to figure out how yeah. to deal with this. And I would point to this book as exemplary in terms of how to deal with it. And the way that it deals with it is that, is that the narrator says, I knew what PPE was. <laughs> it's extraordinary and it's really well done. Like, that's not a question, it's just me gushing <laughs> at you, but like, I guess it's sort of like catapults off of what Rachel was saying, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's weird, right? Like, I'm, we're appearing in front of people who are wearing masks. Yeah. <laughs> not true the last time uh, yeah. um, I was at Books Are Magic and and everything is different yeah. everything is different um, and it's really nice to be in a bookstore yeah. at an event um, yeah I don't know quite how to answer that question except for it's like really lovely to be here right. um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really happy to be here and I think we haven't quite reckoned with like what it means for fiction mm -hmm. that I think one of the things that I rem I actually remember talking to my friend Ann Patchett after um, September 11th and we were all like we're never writing fiction again we really <laughs> thought we were never going to write fiction again and we're like no actually you can write fiction and then there was this moment when we were thinking about the pandemic we thought we can't like how do you write about it and because it's ongoing I think we still we still don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it seems more possible and um, it's easier to get our brains around certain aspects of it. Um, but at the, at the same time, yeah. Yeah, we don't know, I think. But it's also, like, necessary. Yes. And just to go back to what you were asking about, like, Elizabeth's memoir, the memoir, not this novel, is about, like, the saddest thing possible and yet is not a sad book and that is so like that's one of those that book's accomplishments and it's like that's kind of what we need books to do and that's what we need books to do and that feels like the right note to end on it's like we need like our parents are gonna die and <laughs> It's going to write no to it. <laughs> it's going to happen. Death is and coming we're going to die. Song. And like I mean, I was reading I was reading this book and I was like, god, like my kids talk about me dying all the time. And I was like, <laughs> if I die and my kids feel about me being dead the way that like the narrator of this book feels about her mother being dead that it's like a hull, it's the conclusion of a hilarious joke or something, like I will feel like it was a life well lived. And that is how I felt about this book, which is sad as the memoir is but it's not as uh, i just i i don't know i didn't feel sad reading this book i felt like alive mm -hmm. i felt alive and i felt like i should drink a mojito and so like i feel like what better testament to natalie mccracken and also to your fucking talent jesus <laughs> That's what it's about.
y'all can go ahead and get lined up, just good for a moment to get settled, and then you can start that. Um, otherwise, we've got plenty of additional books available for purchase, as well as Elizabeth Ammermann's Bathless titles. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to those who asked questions, and of course, thank you thank to Ron and Elizabeth. <laughs>